A fortnight ago, we saw more men flock to the colors, states, and also men deciding upon their allegiances, while also attending the race at Philippi, on top of losing Lincoln's famous opponent in the 1858 Senate race, Stephen Douglas, the Little Giant. Now, for the next two weeks, this is Civil War. June 8, 1861. By a margin of 2 to 1, voters in western Tennessee vote to approve secession. In eastern Tennessee, nearly the exact same ratio voted to stay in the Union. These regional differences happened throughout the border states as individuals decided which side they were on. In any case, this official vote occurred a little late. The state had already joined the Confederacy because of actions by the governor, Isham Harris. The USS Mississippi established the blockade of Key West on the 8th. Acting Master W. Budd of the USS Resolute captured the schooner Somerset, towed her close to the Virginia shore, and burned her. It is unknown why the ship was not taken into port and claimed as a prize. The Sanitary Commission was also authorized on this day by President Lincoln and the Secretary of War, Simon Cameron. This commission was a relief agency designed to care for sick and wounded Northern soldiers. It was set up to resemble the British Sanitary Commission established during the Crimean War. This agency crusaded to clean camps to prevent the spread of disease as it decimated soldiers in the ranks during the war. Diseases spread rapidly through the regiments. Camps became petri dishes because of poor hygiene, improper disposal of garbage and human waste, inadequate diets, and no real disease treatments. The Sanitary Commission had an insurmountable task. Throughout the war, two-thirds of the estimated 620,000 Civil War deaths occurred as a result of disease. There were over 5.8 million reported illnesses within Civil War armies. The Commission set up fairs in northern states to raise money. The commission used this money to support efforts in the field, including the education of hygienic camp layouts. Early in the war, a surprising amount of camp latrines were dug right next to the camp's water source. Notable members of the Sanitary Commission were nurses Louisa May Alcott and Marianne Bickerdyke, the latter of which established 300 field hospitals during the war. Lastly, on the 8th, Robert E. Lee became unemployed after the Virginia governor transferred all state troops to the Confederate government's control. Lee remained an advisor to Davis as he awaited a new position. On the 9th, the USS Massachusetts captured the British blockade runner Perthshire near Pensacola, Florida. The ship was loaded with cotton and bound for England. British-owned ships attempted to run the blockade throughout the war and would add tensions between the Union and the British Empire. June 10 saw the first serious battle happen, known as the Battle of Big Bethel. Major General Benjamin Butler sent converging columns from Hampton Roads and Newport News against Confederate outposts at Little and Big Bethel. The 1,200 Confederates abandoned Little Bethel and fell back into entrenchments behind Brick Kiln Creek near Big Bethel Church. The entrenched Confederates repulsed the Federal Column of 3,500 men under General Ebenezer Pierce. The 5th New York Zouaves attempted to turn the Confederate flank, but were also unsuccessful. Union forces retired, having suffered 18 dead and 61 wounded. Confederate losses were 1 killed, 7 wounded. Both sides learned an early lesson of the benefits of fighting from entrenched positions. And a Norfolk Navy Yard, Held by Confederate forces, the USS Merrimack was renamed the CSS Virginia and redesignated as an ironclad. On the 11th, pro-Unionists met in Wheeling, Virginia to organize a separate state loyal to the Union. This state would become West Virginia. Colonel E.R.S. Canby took command of Federal forces in the Southwest Department of New Mexico after Colonel William W. Loring resigned and went south. Canby became the general who captured Mobile Bay, Alabama four years from now. On the 13th, Colonel Lou Wallace, the future author of the famous book Ben-Hur, entered into Romney, West Virginia. Romney was an important rail terminus. After a brief skirmish with Confederate forces, his troops returned to his base in Maryland. Wallace was a veteran of the Mexican-American War, who would later serve with Grant as a major general. His poor performance in the upcoming Battle of Shiloh would result in his removal from command and placement into an administrative position for the remainder of the war. Also on this day, Confederate General Joseph Johnston expressed his first doubts about holding an area with substantial reinforcements. This doubt will become a commonplace occurrence throughout the war, especially at Vicksburg and Atlanta. On June 15th, Joe Johnston set fire to the bridge across the Potomac, evacuated Harper's Ferry, and moved south towards Winchester. Federal General Robert Patterson, an almost 70-year-old veteran of the War of 1812 and the War with Mexico, cautiously moved into the space vacated by Johnston. Patterson's move was so slow and timid, his actions disappointed Winfield Scott, who replaced him four days later. General Lee reported to Governor John Letcher of Virginia about Virginia's shore defense, stating, Six batteries have been erected on the Elizabeth River to guard the approaches to Norfolk and the Navy Yard. Sites for batteries on the Potomac have also been selected, 
and arrangements were in progress for their construction. But the entire command of that river being in possession of the U.S. government, a larger force is required for their security than could be devoted to that purpose. Confederate President Jefferson Davis had a policy of attempting to defend all Southern territory. General Lee would consistently attempt to protect Confederate land. This letter to the governor is early evidence that accomplishing this was never really a reasonable undertaking. A much larger force than the Confederates had would be required to defend all the land the Confederacy owned. Army engineers removed a rock weighing 100 tons from the tracks of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad near Point of Rocks, Maryland. Supposedly, Confederate troops had pushed the massive rock down onto the tracks. There's no explanation on how they did this. While at the same time, Federal troops under Nathaniel Lyon occupied Jefferson City, Missouri after the Missouri militia departed heading towards Boonville. June 17th, after occupying Jefferson City, General Lyon moved 1,700 men to boat by Boonville. The Federals attacked Missouri State Guardsmen, forcing them to retire from the town. This small action had major consequences. After the Battle of Boonville, the Federals had gained control of the Missouri River. Also on the 17th, Professor Thaddeus S.C. Lowe and a small group ascended in a tethered balloon to demonstrate the effectiveness of balloons for aerial observation. He was able to make communication via telegraph with President Lincoln. Lowe had recently completed a nine-hour-long, 900-mile trip balloon flight from Cincinnati, Ohio to Unionville, South Carolina. He would become the first individual to use balloons for artillery direction. Lastly on this day, the citizens of Greenville in eastern Tennessee gathered to show their pro-Union support and to discuss possible actions to remain in the Union. June 18. Due to the crucial need for small arms, the federal government began purchasing weapons from commercial manufacturers, such as Colt from Massachusetts. This critical shortage stemmed from inadequate capabilities in the old arsenals and the new ones not yet coming online. Union General James W. Ripley, a 47-year veteran of Mexico and the Seminoles, was made the chief of ordnance and repeatedly berated for the lack of small arms production. Finally, on the 18th, General Robert E. Lee, showing his excellent concept of cooperation between land and sea forces, wrote the commander of the CSS teaser, Robert Randolph Carter, stating, It is desired that the CS steam tender teaser shall unite with the batteries at Jamestown Island in defense of James River, and be employed in obtaining intelligence of the movements of hostile vessels and the landing of troops either side of the river. On the 19th, Francis H. Piermont became provisional governor of what would soon become the state of West Virginia. Piermont had amassed his wealth as a lawyer for the B&O Railroad and investments in coal mines before the war. He had never held any form of elected office before the war. June 20th, over in Kansas, the governor issued a proclamation calling for the citizens to organize military companies to repel attacks from Missouri's pro-South element. These attacks continued throughout the war, with the worst being the slaughter at Lawrence in August of 1863. Kansas's population of about 100,000 citizens lived almost entirely in rural areas. Only 10 towns had a population higher than 500 before the war. Kansas would provide over 20,000 troops to the Union by the end of the war, suffering nearly 8,500 total casualties. Kansas had the highest per capita loss of any northern state. And that brings us to the end of these two weeks. Armies continue to mobilize. The biggest battle so far had involved less than 5,000 men. This will soon change, as a movement towards a large battle is in the works. Within the month, we will discuss the first major conflict of the war. To learn about earlier war preparations, check out this video here. Please remember to like and subscribe. I am posting new videos about the war every week. Subscribing is the best way to know when a new video is being launched. And also please leave your comments and feedback in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. Talk again soon.